I heard about this man and woman who were on their way to the Justice of the Peace to get married, and it just so happens that they were killed in a fatal car accident and found their way up to Heaven's Gate. And uh, they're waiting there on Saint, waiting on Saint Peter, and they're kind of wondering to themselves, you know, what what happens now? I mean, we wanted to get married. Is it possible for us to get married in heaven? And so they're thinking that that would be a great idea. St. Peter finally gets to them and uh, talks to them about heaven, and uh, they ask him the question, can we get married in heaven? And St. Peter says, well, no one's ever asked that question before. Let me check and find out. And he leaves, and they're waiting. They're waiting a couple of months. And as they're waiting and just sitting there, they're kind of wondering, well, you know, with the eternal aspect and everything, what if things don't work out? What if we get married and things don't work out? Can you get a divorce in heaven? So Peter finally comes back after another month, and he says, I found your answer. You can get married in heaven. And they said, well, we've been kind of thinking too, if we get married and decide it doesn't work out, can we get a divorce in heaven? St. Peter gets upset, and he's red in the face, and he slams his clipboard down, and he says, it took me three months to find a minister. Do you have any idea how long it'll take me to find an attorney? <laughs> my apologies to any of my attorney friends if you showed up at church today, you know. Uh, I think that's the question that leads us to the suburban legend that we're going to talk about today. The question is, what if things don't work out? So welcome to week number three of Suburban Legends. Welcome our Sepulpa campus. Welcome those who are maybe watching this online. Again, the question, what if things don't work out, causes people to buy into a legend that goes this way, that living together will prepare us for marriage, that if we live together before we're married, that we'll somehow be more prepared. It'll help us be ready uh, for marriage. And I, I think that's where we're at. We've been talking about those suburban legends, things that sound good, things about family relationships that we buy into, but things that aren't necessarily true. And unfortunately, that's just depicted as the norm today of living together first. Now, Let's define what I mean by that, living together. The term is cohabiting, and it's when a man and a woman decide that they're going to share a home or share an apartment, and, and, and I'm including in that that there is sexual intimacy taking place. And again, it's just depicted as the norm. We're told that half the people today who get married will live together first. And it just shows up in our media. Maybe you've seen the movie The Breakup where Vince Vaughn and Jennifer Aniston, they live together. It's just shown as kind of a natural progression. Now, let me say, if that's you, if I'm talking about you today, I'm not picking on you. We are just looking at what the Bible says about some common misconceptions and some legends here. And I want you to know that I'm glad you're here, and I'm going to ask you just to keep an open mind over the next few minutes. It sounds good. It, it seems to make sense to us living together. And by living together, we'll somehow uh, notice any of the incompatibilities. We'll know how compatible we are. It will maybe up the odds of uh, creating lasting love in our relationship. It'll teach us some things about one another. It will help us make a more informed decision about marriage. After all, you wouldn't buy a car without taking it for a test drive first. I mean, that's kind of the thought process. And as one young lady wrote on the internet, I read this, she said, why not live together first? Or else you might get stuck with different expectations and sexual incompatibility. That's the fear. And, and that's the, the deal with suburban legends. They sound so believable. It just seems to make sense. Now, let's back up for just a minute. Nobody is saying that preparation for marriage isn't a good thing. That, that, that's not a smart thing. In fact, our church, our staff, uh, other organizations that we're involved with are all about preparing people for marriage. And I understand the intent. If you came from a family that had divorce, if you came from a, a family that was painful, then this is very real to you. I want to avoid that, and I want to avoid that at all costs, and I will do it, whatever it takes for me to make sure that, that I don't have to deal with that in a relationship. But the question we've got to ask is, is this really true? 
Does it really prepare us for marriage? And the problem is that it doesn't. It's not true. There is no evidence to support this strongly held belief that if we live together, that it will somehow prepare us. The truth is, it doesn't prepare you. In fact, in virtually every study that's been done, it shows that there is greater risk rather than a lower risk when people live together before marriage. In fact, data from the University of Wisconsin provides a painful bottom line. It says that couples that live together before marriage increase their odds of divorce by 50%. People who live together before they're married, their odds of being divorced are raised by 50%. So, so in other words, if you're living together with someone that you hope to marry someday, you can essentially double the rate of, of, of the future of that relationship by one of you simply moving out until you're married. That's the danger that's involved in this uh, living together arrangement. In fact, we're told that a woman that lives with a man before they get married is twice as likely to be a victim of domestic violence. We're told that depression is three times the rate of those that are married. We're told they have a lower relationship quality. And we're told that sexual anxiety is more characteristic than, in in this particular arrangement than sexual freedom is. The good news is that most people want to do whatever it takes to improve the relationship, to increase the odds of a good relationship. Unfortunately, one of the things that they think will help them doesn't. So what does God's Word have to say about this? What does the Bible give us as far as information that we can take and apply to our lives on this? I want you to write down one main point today that we're going to talk about, we're going to keep coming back to. The point is this, that an intimate relationship is cultivated in the combined security of marital commitment and sexual oneness. An intimate relationship, it's cultivated in the combined security when you have both marital commitment and sexual oneness. See, the, the problem here is with the two biblical foundations of marriage, commitment and sexual intimacy, commitment and sexual oneness. In fact, Genesis 2.24 opens it up. The first man and woman who are married, Adam and Eve, it talks about how a man would leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. That's the commitment. That's the commitment that, that God says is a part of the marriage relationship. And it says, and the two will become one flesh, or the two will become one. That's the sexual oneness that takes place in a marriage relationship. And so we understand there are these two pillars that if you want to have an intimate relationship with someone, it requires both a marital commitment, a lifelong commitment, and sexual oneness. In fact, we even learn about this when the Bible tells us about divorce. Really, the Bible only mentions a couple of occasions where divorce is allowable, and both of us teach both of those times teach us about these pillars or these foundations of marriage. When Jesus says in Matthew 19 that really the only allowable uh, time for divorce is in a, in a, in a, when one of the spouses commits adultery, basically what Jesus is saying is when that partner, when they, they tear at the foundation of, 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 of sexual oneness by committing adultery, by having sex outside the relationship, then that's reason for divorce. Or, or when Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, he talks about abandonment. And, and that being an occasion when someone could consider divorce. Again, it is tearing at the foundation. Abandonment is tearing at the foundation of that marital commitment. So living together before you're married attempts to separate those two foundations that were never meant to be separated. An intimate relationship is cultivated in the combined security of marital commitment and sexual oneness. Let's talk for just a minute about this concept of commitment, about living together before marriage and how it affects commitment. You would think that living together before marriage would increase commitment, that it would be like practice, that it would like help us. We would kind of ease into it, and it would just get better and better. But in fact, 
we find the, the opposite's true. It's associated with lower levels of commitment years into the marriage for those people that live together. In fact, especially in men and their commitment to their wife. Years into the marriage, we find that their, their commitment level is lower. And, and kind of the thought process is that for men, they might marry someone that they would have never married had they not lived together with them. They might have just gone along with things, and, 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 and had they never lived together, they might not have ever married into that relationship. And so while living together, it doesn't require a commitment. It is ultimately more constraining to a relationship. It, it, it keeps people bound to a relationship. And so what some people think of as a test of a relationship, we're going to live together and test the relationship. What actually it becomes is a trap. It holds them to the relationship even if the relationship fails the test. They will stay in the relationship. Living together doesn't increase commitment, and living together doesn't require commitment. In fact, the majority of couples that live together, they find they do not go through a deliberate process of deciding we're going to do this. They do not analyze the relationship. They are not intentional. They are not strategic about the future of the relationship. And they really don't decide that we're going to advance the relationship. In most cases, the majority of cases, what happens is it just happens. One thing leads to another, and they find themselves living together. And it doesn't require a commitment. No one has to repeat any vows. It just happened, which what got us wondering, what would happen if there was some kind of commitment process? Watch this. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to celebrate the cohabitation ceremony of John and Mary. John, will you repeat after me? I, John, take you, Mary. I, John, take you, Mary. To be my cohabitant. To be my cohabitant. To have sex with you. To have sex with you. And to hold you responsible for half the bills. And to hold you responsible for half the bills. To love and to take advantage of you. To love and to take advantage of you. From this day forward. From this day forward. For as long as our arrangement works out. For as long as our arrangement works out. I will be more or less faithful to you. I will be more or less faithful to you. As long as my needs are met. As long as my needs are met. And as long as no one else better comes along. And as long as no one better comes along. If we should break up. If we should break up. It doesn't mean this wasn't special to me. It doesn't mean that this wasn't special to me. Because I love you. Because I love you. Almost as much as I love myself. Almost as much as I love myself. I commit to live with you. I commit to live with you. For as long as we like each other and it works out. For as long as we like each other and it works out. So help me, me. So help me, me. In the name of sin. In the name of sin. Selfishness. Selfishness. And sexual gratification. And sexual gratification. Amen. John and Mary, based on your vows, I now pronounce you living together. John, you may, well, you know what to do. Okay, I know a little silly right there. It doesn't happen that way. There's not a commitment process. It, do, it doesn't work that way. And instead of committing, what most people do, most couples do, is they slide into that kind of arrangement. They slide into that kind of relationship. And, and so what happens is they are somewhat constrained and, and continue to be a part of this continuing relationship instead of deciding, instead of committing, instead of expressing intention to follow through. And what happens is it actually, when you slide into a relationship like that, it actually undermines the development of, of a mutual strong commitment. And so people feel constrained to stay, while at the same time there's really not any true commitment. I like the way that Willard Harley talks about it when he talks about living together. In fact, he compares couples that live, live together to people who are renters instead of buyers. You know, when you rent a, a house or an apartment, you're not responsible for when anything goes wrong. 
Uh, if, if something breaks, then you call the landlord. The landlord is expected to fix it. And if the, par- the apartment doesn't get repaired, or if ultimately you get to the point where you don't like the place, then you just simply find another one. On the other hand, couples that marry before they live together, they tend to be buyers. And he talks about how these couples realize that if anything needs fixing, they're the ones that have to do it, and the sooner the better. See, the truth is, if you're not ready to commit to a relationship, maybe you're not ready for this kind of relationship because an intimate relationship is cultivated in the combined security of marital commitment and sexual oneness. Let's talk about the sexual oneness for just a minute. Uh, We're told in the Bible that sex is powerful. In fact, that passage in Genesis 2.24 that that we, we mentioned earlier, it talks about how the two will become one flesh. And though it certainly includes more than just the sexual relationship, we understand that the two becoming one flesh certainly involves the sexual relationship. There is a bonding that takes place when we look at the relationship of marriage, when we see Adam and Eve and, and marriage relationships throughout the Bible, we understand there is a bonding that takes place through sex. That's just the way God created it. We can go all the way to the New Testament, though, in 1 Peter chapter 6, or excuse me, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and Paul talks about the danger of someone who unites themselves with a prostitute. In fact, we've gone from maybe one extreme where someone's in a committed marriage relationship to probably what you would say is the far extreme, someone that that finds themselves with a prostitute, someone that connects themselves with a prostitute. And Paul says, be careful because in that situation, you are making yourself a part of her body. You are becoming one with a prostitute. And, 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 and Paul says, you don't want to do that. You don't want to be a part of that because you, you, your body was bought for price. You are representative of Jesus Christ. And so if in marriage the sexual relationship uh, creates this bond, and if in connecting with a prostitute, having sex with a prostitute, if there is that bond that takes place, then certainly just about everything in between we would understand that when you have a sexual relationship, there is a bonding that takes place. That's why God says it's reserved for a marriage relationship. And that's why it's no surprise for us to learn from the University of Chicago that says they find that the best sex The most passionate sex is found within the safe relationship of a lifelong monogamous partnership. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 6, I just want to go down and read the tail end of what uh, uh, Paul is talking about there when he referenced that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 6, verse 18 says, Flee from sexual immorality. The term sexual immorality is uh, porneai. It is the same word where we get pornography. It is sexual immorality. It's anything that goes against God's design for the sexual relationship. Anything that is outside of that lifelong marriage relationship, God calls it sexual immorality. That would include sexual, that, that would include adultery. That, that is uh, um, sexual relationship when one of those or both of those people are married outside of that marriage relationship. That would include when the Bible calls fornication, someone who has a sexual relationship before they're married or outside of that relationship. And so Paul says you flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Again, it reaffirms for us that sexual sin is something different. It's not a worse sin than any other sin. What he's saying is it's a sin against the body because your body is designed to bond with someone when you are part of that sexual intimate time. And so he's saying, be careful. It ought to be only in the confines of a married relationship. Do you not know, he goes on to say in verse, uh, in verse 19, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you've received from God. You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God, honor God with your body. We're going to do just a little bit of a demonstration right here to kind of show how this works. And I've got my Play-Doh today. This is a man. 
He's blue. And this is a woman that's supposed to be pink. And you know what happens when a man sees a woman and they get attracted and, you know, she starts flirting with him and, you know, they kind of start talking and start getting together, you know, and have that relationship. We like each other. We stay up long hours talking on the phone. and We just can't get enough of each other. You know how relationship, there's this chemistry, there's this thing that happens and, you know, maybe they finally get around to, you know, holding hands or something like that. We know that's usually kind of typical uh, first step there. And then, you know, maybe there's a little peck on the cheek or a kiss, and then they start kissing. And the natural progression for us in relationships, in that kind of relationship, is that it would just continue. And that's why God says there are certain boundaries, there are certain things of a relationship that are reserved for people who have made a marital commitment. But without that boundary, without that, you know, safeguard, then Ultimately, what's going to happen is those people are going to have sex. I don't really know what to make that look like, and that's why this sermon I told you was rated PG-13 last week. But what happens is, you know, they get involved in a sexual relationship of what God talks about, you know, a a sexual relationship. And, you know, uh, maybe they just have sex with one another, but maybe they end up breaking up. And the problem is that when you treat sex casually, then it still doesn't, it, it doesn't stop the bonding process. It, it still happens. And so if you treat sex casually, you're going to leave a piece of you behind with that person. And if you have sex with multiple people, the problem is that you're going to leave pieces of you laying all around. Because what we've been told is that you can have safe sex, that you can protect yourself from you know, you can protect yourself from from pregnancy, and you can protect yourself from sexually transmitted diseases, but the truth is you can't protect your soul. They don't make a condom for the soul. There is a connection, a bonding that is God-designed and that attaches us to other people. And when we treat sex casually, that bonding still takes place. And having sex with someone outside of marriage is like saying, I permanently bond myself to you without making a permanent commitment to you. And and that's why a, a breakup, even between a boyfriend and a girlfriend or a couple that's living together, that's why it's just as painful as a divorce because there's been that sexual relationship because Through that sexual intimacy, you become one, and you leave some of you behind, and the other person leaves some of them behind. An intimate relationship is cultivated in the combined security of marital commitment and sexual oneness. They're designed to go together. Sexual intimacy, marriage commitment, they are designed to go together. You can't have one without the other. And that's exactly what living together says. I want to enjoy the benefits of a committed relationship without the commitment. I I want to be a part of this thing. I want to be permanently bonded, but I really don't want the permanence. See, we're told in the Bible that God created sex, and we're told that it's good. In fact, can I read to you Proverbs chapter 5, verse 18, the Living Bible? This is what it says. I'm not making it up. It says, be happy, yes, rejoice in your wife, let her tender embrace satisfy you, let her love alone fill you with delight. Right out of the Bible. It's talking about sexual intimacy right there. If you're thinking, you know, if you're kind of getting warm and fuzzy, that's why. It's talking about sexual intimacy. And the fact that word delight, one of the strongest verbs in the Bible, one of the strongest verbs in the Hebrew language, it literally means to be intoxicated, to be enthralled, to be captivated. One translation says, let her steal away your senses. Some of you are thinking, I didn't know that stuff was in the Bible. I can hear it tonight, guys going, honey, let's read that Proverbs chapter 5 passage. You know, Bible reading just, you know, greatly increased in our church. And people reading that all night long. An intimate relationship 
is cultivated in the combined security of marital commitment and sexual oneness. And what Satan tries to do is to mess it up. He takes what God says is good, what God makes is good, and he tries to make it bad. He distorts it. And so you know what Satan is great at? He tries to get people who aren't married to have sex. And you know what else he does? He tries to get people who are married to not have sex. That's his plan for messing up God's incredible design of sex. Because sexual uh, oneness and marital commitment, they're designed to go together. And if you have sex without the commitment, that's not good. If you have the commitment without the sex, that's not God's plan either. Because an intimate relationship is cultivated in the combined security of marital commitment and sexual oneness. And if you're trying to pull those two foundations apart, you are not going to get God's best. You really want to prepare for marriage? If you really want to do some things that are constructive to help you have the best chance of having a good marriage, one of the best things you can do is be committed to be sexually abstinent right now until marriage. To say, I'm going to observe God's plan for this. God tells us this is what's best. And what happens is, if you'll decide that, if you'll decide that I'm going to be abstinent, what it'll do in a relationship that's progressing along is it'll force you to focus on other important things like communication. In fact, that's one of the things that we know what that happens in, 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 in relationships when they get intimate too soon is that they start to lose out on the communication. They don't spend as much time talking. You'll find yourself doing that if you'll avoid that. You'll communicate those important things. If you're planning to be married, if, if you know that's going to happen to you, then one of the things that I would suggest to you is that you get some premarital counseling. In fact, if you're going to have a wedding at our church, that's one of the things that we require, that you do some premarital counseling because we know statistically that couples who spend some time in a, in a, in a counseling situation before they get married spend some time preparing for their marriage as much as they spend preparing for their wedding. We know that statistically they'll have a higher chance of having a, a great relationship. And just give yourself some time to know the other person. Make some intentional decisions about your relationship. Don't just slide deeper into relationship. Don't just let things happen. But make deliberate decisions about the future of your relationship. I mean, can you imagine what would happen if all of these young people right here and all the young people that are sprinkled around in our church today and, and all the single people that are represented here today, imagine if every one of those people said, we are going to commit to God's standard of what of an intimate relationship is supposed to be, and we're not going to try and pull apart those two foundations. Can you imagine how emotionally healthy, how emotionally whole our church would be? Can you imagine the all the difficulties that would be avoided, all the, all the concerns and all the problems that would just be eliminated if all of those people and if all of us committed to this idea of not pulling apart those two foundations of marriage. Can you imagine the committed relationships, the improved marriages that would take place? That's what God wants to do. An intimate relationship is cultivated in the combined security of marital commitment and sexual oneness. And we dare not pull them apart. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for giving us your word in this matter. We thank you for helping us to understand your plan and your design. And I thank you, God, just, just for loving us in a committed way. Loving us even when we fail loving us even when we mess up. And so, God, I'm praying for those that maybe are feeling some guilt right now. 
maybe they are recognizing they have not followed your plan for this, and maybe, God, this is the first time they've ever heard this news from your word. And I'm praying, God, that you would right now begin to help them with forgiveness and moving ahead. And I'm praying, God, that if there are those that need to make some difficult life decisions, some changes in life, that you would give them the strength, the power, the ability through your Holy Spirit to be able to do this. God, may we honor you by the way that we live. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen.